So welcome back to the next session of the day. So it has been a marathon session since the morning right until now. So I'm glad that a lot of you out there are still joining with us. So I can see that the crowd is starting to build up, right? So uh, our next speaker for today uh, will be a very, very interesting uh, speaker. She is uh, the, uh, the co-founder, right? And also the uh, CEO of uh, Arus Academy, right? So we will, uh, in the session, we will learn more about what her organization has been doing. Uh, for me, I see that a lot and a lot of uh, different initiatives that her organization has been uh, doing and creating and serving the teacher community. Hence, that is why I believe that this session over here, it is absolutely crucial that you share it out to all of the teachers out there so that more teachers are able to benefit out of this platform. Because as of the many speakers out there, uh, Alina and her community of uh, trainers and also her organization is truly an organization that is for the teacher and for students, right? So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our next speaker of the day, uh, which is Alina. Hi, Dave. Right. Thank you for having me. Right. Alina, how is it going? Uh, it's going good, good. <laughs> so currently, uh, where are you based in right now? Um, I am based in KL, so I live in Mlawati. Um, okay. so I am. Uh, while the team is scattered everywhere, we have another office which is based in Bukit Metajam, Penang as well. Right. So for the uh, context of uh, everyone that is watching, could you uh, briefly explain to us what uh, Arus Academy is doing and what the uh, entire organization is uh, all about? So I'm, I'm going to talk more about what Arus is during the session later on, but just as a brief introduction, we are a social enterprise and what we do is mainly around creating uh, meaningful learning experiences. And this is done through uh, student programs, through teacher training, through content development and community awareness. Um, and we run as a social enterprise and that means we run as a company, but the profit that we make goes back to the community that we serve. Right. And, and I'm sure a lot of teachers out there might have uh, tuned in to one of your sessions uh, during the uh, Teacher's Day, right? That was quite an interesting rancangan uh, uh, that you put out there. So, uh, right. So without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Alina uh, to share on the topic of choosing the right ad tech for remote learning. So the floor is up to you, Arlina. Thank you, Jay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me on this um, summit. Um, the times have truly changed that we have to meet virtually rather than me on stage. I kind of like it, though. Um, so a few things that I wanted to share is, um, is that I wanted to introduce myself as well as the organization that I represent. So my name is Alina. I am one of the co-founders of Arus Academy, also known as Arus Education. I am also a Teach for Malaysia alumni where I taught in Penang during my two-year fellowship. I then continued teaching in the same school for two more years after that. So I co-founded Arus with three other Teach from Malaysia alumni, David, Daniel, and Felicia. So today we are 13 people strong within the team, all passionate to empower the creation of meaningful experiences. So we believe, what we believe in in Arus is making learning relevant for our students. Hence, the need for continuous in, uh, innovation uh, that happens in the way we run our programs. So you, you can know more about what we do um, on our website, but just briefly, we focus on four different pillars in our rules. We have youth engagement, teacher training, content development, and community awareness. Uh, we work closely with our partners like the Ministry of Education, UNICEF Malaysia, our corporate partners, PwC, FWD Takaful, and also community partners um, and NGO like Trumbaka, in Bukujana Child Kit. So we do uh, uh, different things uh, with different partners. Um, so in the week of March 30th, 2020, which was, um, I think, the second week of MCO, Arus ran a teacher survey on, the, uh, on teachers' readiness to implement e-learning on their own. So the survey received 1,300 um, responses. Um, and here are the highlights from the survey. So at, during the survey, we found that 86% of respondents said that needed help and support to conduct e-learning. 
Uh, the top three answers to what teachers needed support in was, number one was to ensure that students are engaged and participate actively. Number two is creating digital materials that are interactive. And number three is managing Google Classroom. So 20% of teachers were also willing to spend more than five hours a week to be trained. And 44% were willing to spend two to three hours. Now, teachers also indicate that challenges during this time as they themselves are parents to kids who are also going through e-learning with their respective teachers who also need support. Um, so we found very interesting insights from the survey itself. Now, why we wanted to run this survey was because we needed to change the way we support and help our teachers, support and help our students. Um, so internally, right, within ARUS, the team knew that we had to upskill really fast. So we had a lot of programs that were affected by MCO. We had to plan quickly as we wanted to make sure that we could help the people we were supporting, teachers and students mainly. So we were already using uh, technology like Microsoft and Google products to organize ourselves as a company. But now we had to ramp it up to ensure that we're making full use of the technology for our students as well. So we had to explore other ways to make lessons more interactive for the kids. We also started to explore live streaming, right? We had to be really active on social media. And this is when, this is when data started to come in. Our Telegram group for teachers, uh, for teachers, which started off with just a few teachers um, before MCO, shot up to more than 3,000 members in the first few weeks of MCO. So it was really interesting for us to see this. Um, and because the data was coming in, in, in bulk, right, we quickly got ourselves to learn how to automate a lot of our work really fast. Now that we have gone remote, we were dealing with hundreds, sometimes thousands of teachers at one time. Um, and the team enrolled themselves into data camp courses to further um, to further ensure that we have the skills in data management. So if anything, there's a silver lining to the MCO, which was we were forced uh, to accelerate our learning and diversify our approach. So we had to be more present in the virtual world. Virtual world. So as a team, we always say, oh, we need to explore this, we need to explore that. But this time around, we had to do it to ensure that our students and teachers were well supported. Now, I think it's really important that I spend some time explaining what we have done during um, the MCO period, as it would give the audience insights on how I got to share it today. Okay, so our COVID response is that we believe that we can do virtually anything. So together with MOE and UNICEF, the first thing that we did was we built the community Guru Digital Learning. This is an online teacher training module to get teachers started on remote learning. So the content was curated and designed based on the input we got from running the survey I mentioned earlier. The initiative was mentioned by the Director General of Education, Dr. Habiba, during the launching of MOE's digital portal, Delima, earlier this week. So to date, more than 2,000 teachers from 400 um, 400 schools have started on the modules. So almost half of the schools are considered Lua Banda schools. We also collaborated with other teacher organized groups like ED Day and also Google for Education to run live webinars on EdTech series, where we show step-by-step -step tutorials on how to use the tech as well as answer teachers' questions. So we had office hours for teachers as well. So we ran and recorded a total of about 34 episodes um, reaching out to 20,000 teachers um, across the nation um, and, and spent about 40 hours online just, just doing this. Now, coming at the end of this June is Community Guru Digital Learning Plus. This is a collaborative effort between ARSIS corporate partner PwC and three state education departments from Kedah, Perlis, and Sarawak. This program is to coach and mentor 60 teachers on building remote learning resources. Now, as for student programs, we have always had elements of blended learning approach. So we mobilized our laptops and project sets to our students uh, so that our students were able to move to a completely virtual environment. This last weekend, we had our students' exhibition where the kids were then presenting their automated projects. Now, we also designed and launched a mobile learning project called, called Voices of COVID Generation. It was run on WhatsApp and Instagram, where we help students make sense of the pandemic, hear their thoughts and voices. We collaborated with Chumbaka on the English program and Buku Jalanan Chao Kid with the marginalized students that they work with. 
You know, students wrote reflection paper uh, and projects sharing their thoughts on what is happening to the world and how it has changed their lives. So as you can see now, we are already using multiple different technology to reach out to our students as well as our teachers. Um, in terms of content development, so we also have created this content development where it would run independently without much facilitation. So we launched our Future Skills for All site. This is a collaborative project between DG, UNICEF, MDEC, uh, Telenor, and Arus, where video tutorials, notes, assignments on how to program the micro bit is made available. So to date, we have more than 3,000 teachers and students um, on it. Um, 1,500 Google Classrooms have been duplicated for the use of teachers for their own students. So we also turned our project-based lesson materials into an online workbook where students can go through the projects on their own, experience a project-based learning lesson. So each project is also tagged to a UN SDG as well as aligned to the global citizenship education. Just this week, we also launched our financial literacy portal called Fund for Life, together with our partner at WD Takaful, where we provided interactive activities, games, and information on financial literacy that is age appropriate. So more programs under the Fund for Life initiative is coming soon, all through a virtual approach. Um, so like Jay mentioned, we even organized a virtual Hari Guru where we got local celebrities to record themselves. We curated student performances and we even got Rizal Van Gezel, a well-known Malaysian stand-up comedian to crack some jokes live with us on YouTube. So all of this was done during the MCO period. So we got to learn a lot of new tech along the way, as well as hone our existing tech skills to ensure that whatever that we're using uh, was effective for our teachers and our students. Um, okay, so now with everything that has happened, we learned a whole bunch on how to plan and execute remote learning. So it's not as easy as people think. Okay, so what is this sharing about today? And also not about lah. Okay. Um, there's a few things what this is about, yeah? Uh, this sharing is based on experience working with teachers and creating remote learning content. Okay, so it's based on our experience, it's based on our reading, it's based on um, the insights that we got from teachers, from the focus groups that we, we spoke to with our teachers. I also want to acknowledge that there are many elements and experiences about the physical classroom that cannot be replaced by technology. So at any point you think Alina is all about technology, and not really. I think there should be a healthy balance of technology and also presence in the physical sense. Yeah. Thirdly, there are still teachers are still very much essential in the education system. No technology, no matter how advanced, can ever replace our teachers today. But a resilient, skilled teacher is even more important in this time and day. And lastly, this is a COVID response to education, a pandemic situation. We are in a global crisis, so we don't have to get everything right from the get-go. So I saw a lot of the um, uh, comments from teachers before the, the summit happened, and a lot of teachers were sharing about um, how they're very disgruntled about how, how students are not responding, how um, you know they couldn't manage the, the stress and all that. I just want to reiterate that we are in a global crisis environment. When it comes to a global crisis response, there are many other reasons why e-learning fails. This includes the well-being of our students and teachers' mental health, family backgrounds, and socioeconomic status. That's very important to acknowledge. So I just want to make sure that that is clear. Now, what is this sharing not about? This sharing is not about me uh, running a tutorial on a specific technology. Okay, this is, I'm not running a tutorial on how to run Google Classroom, ke, StreamYard, ke, no, no, no. So if you, if you need that support, there's a bunch of resources already on YouTube, but today is not it. Okay, so today is just me sharing a few strategies on how to choose the right tech for your classroom um, or your for future classroom, okay? Okay, so most importantly, I also want to reiterate that this is a sharing strategy on ways to think about tech, okay? This, this, this is a sharing on strategies, not so much a tutorial. Arus does not represent any particular tech company. We are tech agnostic, meaning we are not faithful to any one, uh, any one technology. 
we are faithful to our belief in equity and access for all in education. We run our programs and we design our programs around this belief and not around a particular technology. But do we have favorites? Uh, does Alina have favorites? Do we have a technology that we completely love and adore? Definitely, I have a few. But are we blinded by this love? No, we are not. So I just want to reiterate that, yeah? So we do not represent any tech company. Okay, so before I really get into it, I want to run a really quick survey with everybody. So if you're on your devices, do go on menti.com and key in the code or scan the QR code to answer the survey. So my survey question is super simple. How long should online sessions be? So I'm going to wait for about one minute or 30 seconds. I know there's going to be a lag. So I'm going to wait for a bit so that you guys have the time to go on menti.com. Um, the code is 856798 and just choose how long do you think online sessions should be? Is it 15 to 20 minutes, 20 to 40 minutes, 40 to 60 minutes, uh, or 60 to 90 minutes? Okay, Minari. Okay, so I've got a few people already answering. Um, so if you if you haven't had the chance to see the code, it's menti.com and the uh, and the code to enter is eight five six seven nine eight. Okay, so it's going up and down. I'm probably gonna wait for about um, twenty more seconds just so that I could get a few more people to um, to come back to me on this. Okay, the pink is going up. All right. Okay. So you can continue. Um, <laughs> you can continue voting, but I'm going to end it at here. So I'm going to see that it's a lot of you uh, voted for 20 to 40 minutes now. I'm going to go back to uh, my presentation, okay? Now, based on researchers at the University of Peking in China have said that online sessions between 15 to 30 minutes are the most effective. Now, you might have already seen this in your homes where children just, where your children just start to run around when lessons go beyond a certain period. Right? A lot of best practices are coming out of China as they had elite time with school closure. So a lot of the best practices are coming out from China. Okay, Their schools closed 10 weeks before everyone else globally. So they had a lot of lead time to explore what was working, what was not working. So their schools, uh, the research that came out of Unipacking and reported in World Economic Forum was that 20 minutes is just the right amount of time to spend on screen time. Now, the formula is very simple. You plan for short screen time, and then you add more activities that are off screen, and this can result in a reduction of screen time to take, which is really important. So once students are tired of the screen, it's really difficult for them to continue and be consistent with remote learning. So if every time they have to go online to learn something new, 20 minutes would be a good time to spend with them. Okay, now let's take a look at our context on how our schools had to close. Okay, so China had that lead time 10 weeks, right, to explore uh, yada yada, and then a lot of best practices came out of it. So let's let's come back to Malaysia. What happened in Malaysia? Let's take a look at our context on how our schools had to close. On the 16th of March 2020, the Prime Minister announced that MCO will start on the 18th of March, two days after his announcement. At this moment in time, um, we were in our, during our school holidays. And the Prime Minister said, uh, schools are to be closed, everyone should stay home, learning will resume virtually if the MCO uh, continues. I just want to share 
And the efficiency of transitioning to remote learning depends on three key areas. Number one is our preparedness for it. Number two is our technology tools. And number three is our overall student support infrastructure. That is the, the key areas on how we can transition to remote learning. In the context of Malaysia, let's look at preparedness, okay? MCO started in the middle of a school holiday towards the end, yeah, towards the end. So some teachers were back in their hometown. They left all of their laptop books, teaching materials are uh, either back at home or in school. Uh, students left books in their schools. Most teachers and students have no experience teaching or learning virtually. Okay, so in terms of preparedness, we were definitely not prepared for uh, remote learning. When it comes to technology tools, before MCO happened, there were no sufficient training done for teachers or students to go into 100% remote learning. Sure, there were training in terms of technology, um, etc., uh, but not to go online completely. Um, another issue was there were so many technology tools available. Which tool do we use, right? Let's look at the third key area, the overall student support infrastructure. Students were first not familiar. Not only were students not familiar with technology, their parents were not familiar with technology that, that has got to do with learning. Lack of digital skills or literacy. Now, people might say, hey, these young folks are always on their phones. What? They should be able to know how to use technology. But the thing is, the skills to play games and the skills to learn are completely different skills. Okay? So these skills need to be honed. Um, it needs to grow. It doesn't, does not come naturally just because you're a gamer, for example. Um, and there's also a lack of support when faced with technical issues, right? Um, so who do they go to if, they, if something happens to their laptop? Who do they go to if something happens to their tablet or their phones? Um, there's a lack of technical support there. What happens uh, during a live session and then the internet just, you know, cuts off? What happens? What to do during that time? So in terms of these three key areas to transition to remote learning efficiency, we were not in an environment that would, that would give us the most efficiency in this transition. Yeah? So if you feel like, oh my God, my remote learning experience was bad, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It was the way things were happening that did not give you the right environment to, to ensure um, efficient remote learning experience. Um, now, before I go into the technology, it is very important and crucial that we set some guiding principles. Now, guiding principles are not around to make things rigid. It is to ensure long-term consistency. It is not a comprehensive list, the one that I'm going to show you, but it has been extremely useful for me personally as well. So this, you will find that consistency in remote learning is very, very crucial. So having some guiding principles, so having some guiding principles can help you remain, make sure that you are consistent throughout the lesson planning and, and execution. Now, there are two guiding principles that, that I have um, found very useful. One is for planning itself, and the other one is for when using technology. So when for planning, teachers remember this, keep it simple, 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 simple. Everything takes longer during remote learning, yeah? Everything takes longer. So keep it simple. The more you put into it, the more um, hiccups there are going to be. And, and we are trying to manage those hiccups, yeah? Number two is break down your content. Chunk it. Okay, make sure it's simple and it has been chunked. Do not try to go all out wanting to complete the syllabus. You need to prioritize now. Not everything can be covered anymore, okay? And number three, get organized. Schedule your classes, schedule your office hours, put it up in the calendar so that you know. Okay, what are the times that are okay for you to be online or are the times for you to be, are you okay to be disturbed on your phone, for example? Number four, communicate this very, very clearly to your students later on. So once you have all of this organized, you should be able to communicate this clearly to both students and parents. And lastly, collaborate. I cannot 
emphasize enough on how important it is for teachers to be collaborating and asking for help during this entire experience of coming up with remote learning experiences. Okay, so that's for planning. Now for when using technology, my guiding principles are the following. Number one is that arrange your content in the most intuitive way possible knowing that there is going to be no facilitators, no helpers for your students. So what you need to do is put yourself in the student's shoes. How would you arrange your content using the technology that you have chosen to be as intuitive as possible? Okay, that's one. Number two is be intentional with the way you use your technology. Don't choose a technology because, oh, it's really cool. No. You must be intentional with why you're using something cool, for example. Why do you need um, to use YouTube, for example? Why do you need to use quizzes or Kahoot? There must be something that is um, important in the way that your students learn that you are using this technology. Not because majority of my colleagues are using Kahoot, for example. Okay? I'll go in depth into how we do this. Um, and number three, clear instructions and expectations should be laid out, okay? Clear expectations on how to use the technology, uh, what happens, who to ask, uh, what happens when something uh, goes bad. All of this needs to be clearly documented uh, for the students. Um, number four is diversify examples. Um, I will go in depth again uh, later on on how to diversify examples. When it comes to remote learning, there are so many different approaches that we can use and students learn so differently from one another. It is best if we could allow for diversification to happen in terms of assignments and assessment. Okay. Now, I know we're excited to jump right into the cool technology, but I cannot emphasize enough about how important it is to do the work before we get to the tech, okay? So I know we all want to go into this running marathon, right? But before you can run this marathon, you got to work out, you got to eat right. So this is part of that remote learning experience. We have to plan, plan, plan. So the saying, if you fail to plan, then you've Plan to fail cannot ring truer when it comes to remote learning. I have come up with a few questions um, that we're going to look at uh, in terms of planning for this remote learning. Yeah? Number one is what kind of access and devices do you and your students have? What do you have and what do, um, does your students have? If you have a um, tablet, what is your students using? Are they using a laptop or are they using a uh, smartphone. So this needs to be matched accordingly. Number two, what are your, how, where are you organizing your content? Where is it going to? Okay, where is this content going to? Is it going into a, a WhatsApp group? Is this going into a Google Classroom, a Microsoft Teams, an LMS? Where is it going? Okay. Number three is how are you running your lessons? Are you running it synchronously with your students? Asynchronously? How are you running this? And number four is, how are you breaking down your content and in what format is this? So later on, you'll see the, the, the variety of technology that is available um, for you to use and which format would you go for. Okay, so it's very important that we keep in mind to be intentional in the way we use our technology. Not to be using everything, but prioritizing based on our plan. Okay. Now, the first one, what kind of access and devices do you and your students have? It is raining heavily, by the way, um, in Mlawati. So if you hear the status, it's because I'm right outside my balcony. Um, okay. So the first one is what kind of access and devices do you and your students have? Knowing this is crucial information and can inform you on why or how your students get online. So it can also explain why some are able to do the assignments well and some don't. So either they go fully online, so they have stable internet on variety of devices. Is it hybrid, intermittent internet on mostly smartphones, for example, or fully offline? They may have device, but they are not connected at all. So knowing this about your students is very important. So if you have a Google Classroom, but nobody can access that Google Classroom, is your Google Classroom efficient? Is Google Classroom bad? No. 
is because the mapping was not done right, okay? So questions to ask and identify are a few. What are your connections and devices availability? As a teacher, what are your students? And how are your students using or sharing these devices? So the way they might have good internet, they might have a laptop that is working, but they might also be sharing that same laptop with four other siblings who are also going through remote learning. So having this context can really help us plan better. So have that time to map uh, you and your students out, okay? Now the second one is where are you organizing your content? So you know uh, the different types of uh, devices and availability for connections. Now we look into what should we use? Should we use Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, LMS? Should we use social media, Instagram, Facebook group, or chat apps like Telegram or WhatsApp? Um, or should it be like completely physical packages or SMS? So knowing the first part is important because it would lead to where are you going to put all of your e-learning content, okay? So I've mapped it in this way from the top to the um, down. So the top is as, as um, online as you can go, lah. that's the best, right? And then the bottom is no devices, no internet, nothing. You cannot help them, right? And, and even I am struggling thinking about how do I help the ones with the ones that are completely at the bottom, okay? So, so here is where I give you a view of what works at what level, yeah? Okay, now, now that you know there's Google Classroom, there's Microsoft Teams, there's social media, there's chat apps, there's physical packages or SMS, how are you running your lesson? There are two types of how we can run our lessons uh, remotely. The first one is running it synchronously meaning everybody goes online at the same time. We look at the same materials together, but all virtually, okay? All together at the same time, synchronous. Or it could be asynchronous, meaning teachers give out the tasks, but students will be able to complete their tasks, complete the assignments at their own time, at, at their own pace, okay? So during synchronous sessions, this could be schedule your live video sessions where you get to see everybody, like uh, Microsoft Teams, and you can see everyone on your screen, right? Um, asynchronously is where you part your lesson materials and assignments uh, are posted. For social media and chat apps, teachers can still run synchronous sessions, meaning they can go live on Instagram, they can go live on Facebook, but students will only be seeing teachers and teachers won't be able to see the students but students can still interact at the chat, okay? Or if it's Telegram or WhatsApp, uh, teachers can then schedule Q&A session where I will be online and I will be answering your questions on WhatsApp or Telegram at this point, okay? So those are synchronous sessions. Asynchronous are the social media postings, um, the Telegram chat bots that if, if you are familiar with it, or sharing materials in, in your chat groups, in your respective chat groups. For physical packages or SMSs, it's very difficult to run synchronous sessions here, but asynchronously, we could think about packaging our uh, materials and sending, sending it off or scheduling pickups um, or, or send instructions via SMS that is short and concise, okay? Now, how are you breaking down your content and in what format? So this is where I'm going to show you a bunch of technology, right? And there are different ways of you to use it. So when we go into like how you're going to break it down, you can break it down into like videos, content, group activities, assessment, and each of these parts have its own technology for you to use. Now, for videos, you can go live video using StreamYet, like how we're doing it right, right now, Google Meet, Microsoft Teams, or you could have recorded instructional videos um, where it's you talking to your students, but all recorded. Uh, if you want to have a screen, then you can use Screencastify, you can use Loom, or if you don't have videos that you are um, creating yourself, so you can always curate existing videos via YouTube. So even with videos, right, there are already so many different options for teachers to use. So what is the easiest for you at this point? And what is the most useful for your students at this point? Do not curate YouTube videos when your students do not have access to YouTube videos, if they do not have enough data to, to access YouTube videos, okay? So for example, if your students have less data, so something short that you record on your phone, for example, for less than two minutes, 
uh, compress, send via WhatsApp or Telegram is something that you can consider. In terms of content, so you have instructional slides and visual, you have notes that you can send out, you can have voice notes, and all of this different content uses different technology. So instructional slides, you can always use PowerPoint, Google Slides, for notes, so many Google products and Microsoft products that you can use. Um, it has the collaborative element to it as well. Um, voice notes, um, you can send voice notes on Telegram or WhatsApp. So these are the different types of technology that you can think about. But again, I want everybody to keep in mind to be intentional to why you're using um, these products. Group activities. So there are many group um, uh, technology that uses collaboration as part of their core element. So we're looking at Jamboard, for example, where it's virtual uh, post-it notes. Or we're looking at Wakelet, where you can curate content together. We're looking at Padlet that is similar to Jamboard, but Padlet is much more organized. So this is something that you can look into. When it comes to assessment, there is interactive assessment, the usual quizzes that you hear about, the Kahoot, individual assignments, could be a Google Forms on quiz mode, for example. So just looking at this, and this is not a comprehensive list, just looking at this, there are already so many different technology that teachers can explore, okay? Um, what do you choose? How do you choose? It all depends on the first three questions that I, that I asked, okay, earlier, which was um, what is your access? Where are you going to put it on? Um, and now how are you breaking it down? Uh, and if you are more adventurous and more advanced, there are many AR, VR, experiential technology that you can use. One of my favorite to explore is called Assembler, A-S-S-E-M-B-L-R, Assembler. Um, and I see a lot of our public school teachers are, are exploring and creating content on Assembler, which is amazing. Okay, now one important tip. So the, all of this technology is great. No matter what you choose, spend time going through the steps of that technology that you've chosen with your students. Set ground rules. So even with us, even with my team, we, if we make sure that we never miss the steps. Even if that means having to spend a few weeks going over and over again the ground rules. Because once your students get it, remote learning is going to be really fun for you and your students, okay? Now, here's an example, yeah? So I've, I've given you a bunch of different, I've shown you a bunch of different technology met for different uses. I'm gonna give you an example. Google Classroom, most of us are on it. Uh, if you're a teacher, you're, you're probably very familiar. Just looking at the layout of the Google Classroom is very clear, the top is a topic, and then I break it down into material. The first one is a slide plus a video, and then it's a question, discussion based on the material on top, and then I give them assignment to check for understanding, a very quick quiz. And then I close the topic with an assignment for higher order thinking skills. So all of this is part of the sejarah subject for Form 1, if I'm not mistaken. So it starts off with a topic, material, question for discussion, assignments for uh, checking for understanding, and then test if the students could go beyond. So this way of um, organizing your content is very intuitive for the students. They can see the big topic, they know the material, and then after that, they, they discuss with their friends and then they go into their individual assignments. This is how uh, you could uh, organize your Google Classroom. Now I'm gonna show you how Google Classroom, the same technology can be different for different people. Same technology, but different experience. So this is how I have shown you how um, the, the, the first example, how this has been organized. And then there's a bunch of other ways for you to organize the same content. So if you look here, content is being organized based on weeks. So for example, the week of 13th April, this is what you have to do. For the week of 6th April, this is what you have to do. So it can be organized based on weeks. And then it can also be organized based on very, very short subtopics, meaning further chunked. So the first one was based on chapter. This one is based on subtopics. And then it can also be uh, organized based on the types of materials. 
So the first one is bahan pembelajaran, so your lesson material. The second one is your discussion. The third one is your quiz. And the fourth one is your group assignments. So if you want to look for your group assignments, you go to the group assignments topic. There is no right or wrong in the way you organize your Google Classroom. But the most important thing about technology is to be consistent. If you are going to organize it based on chapter, do not mix and match in your Google Classroom. It is going to be confusing for both you and your students. So it's very important that you organize it and then stick to it. Be consistent, all right? Okay, so that's Google Classroom, something that we're all probably familiar with. And then there's mobile learning via chat. So I have been um, really passionate about wanting to learn more about uh, mobile learning only because a lot of the students that we work with uh, do not have access to the right devices for Google Classroom or for Microsoft Teams. A lot of them do have chat apps. So examples like chat apps, just because we're on a chat does not mean we forego our lesson plan. Lesson plans are very important to organize your thoughts and your flow. So for example, here is an example lesson plan that I have created where I always start off the first, uh, the first time I'm opening up a new topic, I will always start with a visual, uh, visual marker. So if I show this five emoji, that means new topic is coming up, everybody. And then I will have everything um, uh, typed out. All I have to do then is then copy, paste, and move it to Telegram. I am also very passionate about building Telegram bots because it has helped in managing remote learning. So I'm going to show you an example of how a student can use a um, Telegram bot. Okay. So you go on Telegram and then you see all of these buttons at the bottom. Okay. So when you click Jadual class um, and then when you click video pengajar, you, you click on the Minggu and then the video will come up and then you watch the video. And then you can go back and then you click on slide pengajaran, you choose the right week, and then there are notes and slides and questions for you to answer. And the questions are already embedded on Telegram. So you can actually choose the answers here, okay? Choose the answer, and then there are more notes and, um, and, and pictures. So once you are done with the notes of the session, you can go back and then you can answer the quiz. So you choose the quiz for the first week, the question will come up, the answers are going to appear, and then you choose your questions. And then you can also speak directly to me as a teacher when you click hubungi cikgu, and then you can tell me whatever you want to tell me, and I will then be able to respond to you. Why I like Telegram bots are because um, it filters the conversations between students and teachers but, and only focus on the thing that students want to see. You can always have two Telegram groups. One is the bot and one is the open discussion one. The bot, you have already set it, right? You have already set the bot. Um, so whatever, uh, how your lesson is run is based on that bot that you've set it to. So that's an example of using mobile learning via chat apps. Another example that I want to share is we have also explored social media as part of running our lessons. So for example, I want to show you um, the Instagram account that we have. So we created Voices of the COVID Generation. This is a project-based lesson completely on Instagram and WhatsApp. So all of the content are part as postings on Instagram and interactive elements happen in the comments or during the Instagram stories. So when you click on the Instagram stories, you get uh, quick snippets of what's happening, you get the links to, to the videos, and you get to answer questions right on Instagram, okay? And then, we have recently moved to TikTok. You know why we moved to TikTok? TikTok gives me headaches. I have to admit this. Um, it gives me a lot of headache. But we are on TikTok because the young people are on TikTok. And if we could put more elements of educational content on TikTok, then probably it would get to our students. Um, so this is our TikTok, Guru Future Skills. And what I'm going to share with you is a bunch of micro -bits. That's as a 
especially TikTok. Even I don't get it, but the students love it. So we have gone viral on TikTok. We have more than a hundred, like a few thousand, fourteen hundred thousand views on our TikTok views, and we have so many primary school kids following us. So in many ways, even though I don't get it, the students get it a lot. So they they are on our TikTok. They're asking questions about how the program microbit. Um, another. Uh, I I happen to follow this one um, person on TikTok who teaches math on TikTok, and this particular video that I'm showing you got 3.1 million views. That's amazing. So I'm just gonna show it to you. So TikTok content does not go longer than one minute. That's that's the attention span of our young kids these days. So that particular person has his account filled up with tips on mathematics, and he has a bunch of followers who follows him and comments and asks him questions on mathematics. So these are the different ways of using technology for the sake of education. Okay. Um, there are quick examples of how that can be used. So for example, if you're thinking about screen recording, for example, screen recording does not only have to be your voice and, and your uh, deck uh, slides, but it could also, uh, if you use the right technology, for example, like Screencastify or Loom, you can make use of the pen um, so that it's more interactive, so that students are able to focus in your videos. It's also nice if they can hear your voice, it's more personalized. So technology like Screencastify, uh, the free version allows you to go up to two minutes of video, but that's that's enough, Chigu. Two minutes is good enough. You break it up, break up your content to be as, um, as succinct as, as possible. So this is also another example of Google Form. So Google Form, we're all familiar with Google Form, but Google Form can also be very fun if we know how to use it. So this is a form that we made. Um, uh, this is a form that we made to on, on financial literacy during MCO. So look at the way we arranged it. We put pictures in um, and then it's, it follows a story. And then we go next. And then sudah bersedia, yes, we go next. And then we, we put more stories. We don't have questions at every page, but we have story as if they're going through an adventure. And then we click next. And then they get to answer. And all of our answers are very visual as well. So they get to choose. Okay, lah, I'm not going to read. I'm just going to go just for the sake of showing. Um, and then kalau salah, they have to turn back. So it's like an adventure for them until they get to the end of this Pak Pandey story. So think about how you would arrange your Google Form. Google Forms do not have to be boring. It can be exciting. You can bring your students into a journey with you. OK? So that's Google Form. Um, things you should avoid. So I'm, I'm closing uh, into my ending already. So things you should avoid. I'm going to stick to, I think, three that I've prepared for you. Number one is introducing too many new technology at one time. I know that sometimes we get super excited, but my advice is to focus on one technology. And once your students are used to it, are great at it, then you can explore new technology with them. Do not introduce new technology and new content together. They will not be able to manage that much learning at one time, okay? Number two is using a certain tech because everyone else is using that technology. So be intentional. So recently, when um, when MOE launched Delima, and um, the, the statistics shows that, you know, 60% of students are on Google Classrooms. I got questions from teachers who are not using Google Classroom saying, Alina, should I move to Google Classroom? My answer is, if your students cannot access Google Classroom, do not go for Google Classroom, okay? Go with the technology that reaches your students, okay? Do not be 
afraid of the statistics. Oh my God, I'm not part of the majority. Nanti I tertinggal. Don't worry about all that. Worry about your kids. Okay. Number three, do not jump straight into using the technology without planning first. I cannot emphasize this more. Plan your lesson first before you jump into your technology. Okay. So have a visual of how your technology is going to look like and then the technology fits into your plan. Okay. A recap. Okay, so four or seven, I'm supposed to end at 4.15. I'm really good with my timing this time around. My key takeaway, if there's any takeaway that I would want all of um, my fellow teachers to take away from my session, are a few. Number one is plan, plan, plan. If you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Okay, so it's really important that we go into this marathon having had a proper diet, having had proper training, okay, because it is a marathon. Number two is technology can only do so much. Teacher is key in planning effective and meaningful lesson. Without you teachers curating and planning, technology is just that. It does not mean anything. So technology can only do so much. The person, the star is you, it's not the technology, okay? Technology change, it gets updated. Do not be afraid to explore. Do not be afraid for change. So at this point, I think we have to accept that change is going to happen and we shall not be afraid of it. We shall embrace change and we shall go through this marathon together as a team. Okay, number four, being resilient is super important. Being resilient means that when you run a Google Meet, for example, and only two or three students come to your Google Meet, that does not mean you have failed. It does not mean that. We are going through a global crisis. There are many other reasons why your students are not attending your live session. Okay? Um, and number five, the best technology is not the most high tech. The best technology is not the most expensive technology. The best technology is the one that your students can access. And if you choose a technology that could reach your students, but other people think that technology is not as advanced, then to hell with them because our focus is our students. The best technology is not the most high tech. The best technology is the one that your students can access. Okay, and with that, at 4.09, I end my session. I would welcome all of you um, to visit our Facebook, our Instagram. Um, I just realized that StreamYard has um, blocked it, so I'm going to put it up here. So we have a Facebook, we have um, our Instagram, we have our YouTube, we have Twitter, and we also have a website that you can come and take a look. Um, I would like to call Jay back. Okay. Welcome back, Jay. So uh, if you have uh, enjoyed Alina's session as much as I do, please comment Alina in the comment section below. Wow, so much energy, enthusiasm. Wow, I was mesmerized towards the entire uh, sharing session, Alina. Right. Uh, awesome things uh, that you are doing over here. I would just like to uh, find out from Alina, right, uh, before that. Uh, personal question of mine, with all of the tools available here, right, I guess there are a lot of questions from the comment section that are asking, how do I get access to tutorials like this? How do I get access to know how to create uh, bots for Telegram, to create a Google Classroom, to create a, uh, all, all this software that you have just shown us? Yeah, how do they get access to that? Because there's, there's a few ways to do that, right? Um, one is YouTube is filled with that. If you follow Pendidik Digital uh, YouTube, um, if you follow EDD, uh, so these are teacher organized groups that set up their own tutorial. And if you are really interested to be, to know um, really well about the, the, everything about the technology, then what you can do is uh, you can apply to be a, a Google educator, for example. Uh, and I just found out that Google Education Malaysia is giving out a lot of free vouchers for teachers. So if you want to be certified as a Google Educator, that's something that you can look into. Uh, Microsoft Certified Educator as well. So within MOE itself, there, ha there has been a lot of um, certified educators. Uh, so if you really want to be part of it, really want to understand your technology, you can go through those cour courses as well.
Right. Okay, so there you have it. And also in your YouTube channel, you have a lot of this tutorials available, am I right? Correct. So if you go on Arus Academy uh, YouTube tutorials, we have organized our webinars accordingly. Uh, so you can go into our tutorials and you can, you can watch them. Right. So towards the entire presentation by Alina, what I've figured out or what I've observed is that you have just provided us with like a dictionary for what we should do in MCO teaching. So you, bro you broke it down from the bird's eye view, from the perspective, the principle to how to apply it. So uh, I guess a lot of teachers out there would definitely have uh, a lot of insight on how they can conduct their classes even more, right? So uh, opening up to any questions uh, with those who are watching right now that you have for Alina with regards to classroom learning or any, anything whatsoever. Okay, so uh, questions. One of the questions above, uh, must it be two hours full synchronous class or can we also consider that the two hours must also be, must include synchronous, asynchronous and offline activities? This question might be answering a few questions before because I would not recommend two hours of synchronous classrooms, okay? No two hours synchronous class. I think the best, uh, for younger students, it's probably 20 minutes. For students who can pay more attention, for older ones, uh, probably uh, the university students, they can go up to 30, 40 minutes. But I wouldn't go beyond that. Uh, so two hours can be broken down into 20 minutes of uh, online screen time and a lot of then offline uh, assignments for them as well. Like what do they have to read? Um, so so don't, don't um, confuse screen time as just live. Um, but that's screen time of, you know, reading uh, but with a lot of the textbooks, if they are, they, if they have that digital textbooks, do assign the, the reading offline. Right. Okay. Ho hopefully that answers the question. Now, okay, the questions are pouring in over here. Uh, I'd just like to handpick a few. Um, all right. When schools eventually restart, teachers will try to help students to catch up in the most efficient way possible that will impact on knowledge retention, right? So risk of the students and the teachers to burn out. Is this efficiency a waste of time? So yeah, any comments on that? With regards to uh, how, how can a student and teacher catch up to the syllabus that uh, they were supposed to complete? I think even with school reopening, it is very important that remote learning does not go away. The only way for everybody to catch up is to have both uh, is a, to have a blended learning approach. And another thing that I really want to push forward is that do not rush for for completing your syllabus. Okay, if there is anything that we should be focusing on is the mental health of our students when school reopens and the mental health of our teachers. When you are healthy, when your students are healthy, then everybody can catch up. Um, so I think that's something that is really important for teachers to stand their ground. So this, I am the teacher. I know what is the best needs for my students. And so I will plan for the best of my students. Right. Okay. So personal question for me, Alina. Uh, for those who are watching right now and also that will be watching offline later or the next few days to come, right? If they are teachers, are they able to get access to all the wonderful syllabus that you've just shown, like the Pandir uh, Google Classroom? Right. Yeah. Are they able to get access to that? Yeah. Yes. Um, they will have access to Jay, I will share with you all the link. Is it possible for you to then share it with everybody else? I will share with you the community group, digital learning, that one. Anybody, any teacher from any school, even private schools, can go on it to watch the tutorial. I will share the Papande sample form with everybody. That's something that you can explore as well. So, Jay, I will WhatsApp you right after this. Definitely. Right. So those of you teachers out there, there you go. So do not say that you don't have interesting contents. What we just witnessed here, uh, I myself, I would want to try it after this, right? So the Pak Pandir, uh, wow, that was a very creative way of, of teaching things. I, I hope more teachers are, 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 are seeing this on how creative you can really get with technology and the available free softwares out there, right? It's all about creativity and creating things. So personally, uh, me to you, Alina, I would just like to find out how long did it take for you and your team to come up with all of this concept? So three months ago, MCO, how long did it take for you to come up with all of this? 
I think because I dedicated the whole MCO to really master and understand remote learning, I wouldn't say I, I know it at the back of my hand, but it has helped me uh, crafted a few guiding principles that are very important for me. Um, and I know, and another thing that I really love is how uh, amazing our teachers are when it comes to support. Any questions that comes up, teachers are so willing to share, teachers are so willing to help each other. And that's what I think that I'm very thankful for, for all the teacher support that I get. Right. Um, okay, uh, Alina, also questions from me, myself, uh, sorry uh, for the audiences there. Uh, what type of subjects are you teaching? So with all the, the materials that you've just shown us, right? What specific mm. subjects? Um, so a few subjects that we focus on is Reka Bentuk and Technology uh, for Year 5 as well as Secondary. Uh, so that's where our microbit curriculum comes in. We also look at ASA Science Computer, Science Computer uh, for Form 1 all the way to Form 5. Uh, we also look at Mathematics, Science, Sejarah and Geography, which is what our project-based learning um, is based on. And Voices of COVID Generation is also based on these four subjects. Um, so th those are the main subjects that we that we focus on. Okay, so right now opening up the questions to the floor. Now over here, there's a question. Um, okay, uh, just hold on. Okay, uh, I would really. I would really like, to, I guess, I would really like to learn the telegram tricks that you have just shown. Surely it will help us to communicate with students that have limited internet access. I guess this is a very important topic. We spoke to about a lot of teachers that uh, has internet access, but uh, very few of their students are able to get internet access. So yeah, how do they get uh, tricks or <laughs> tutorials on this? I know I told you guys that I'm not faithful to any one technology, but I am quite in love with telegram. So one of the things that I really want to do is come up with a step-by-step -step tutorial on how you can come up with your own Telegram bot. So this is already in planning to further enhance our Community Guru Digital Learning website. So right now, it has a lot of Google products. Coming up, we are planning to put Telegram, we are planning to put more Microsoft technology and more technology on the Community Guru uh, portal. So do follow us and stay tuned on all of the updates that are coming, uh, coming up. Okay, so any other questions with regards to uh, technology or teaching, please do comment. Uh, and also do remember to fill in the feedback form for Alina if you have further questions that we can address to Alina. I'm sure you have more, uh, more amazing uh, lesson plans and more awesome tools that is up your sleeve. I guess today we only touched the, touch the tip of the iceberg that what your team is currently uh, running, am I right? Yes. So much exciting things when it comes to remote learning. Right. So uh, in that case, let me just bring up another question over here. Um, okay, I'm I'm flooded with uh, all the Alina comments over here. Right. They they really love your sharing session. Oh, thank you, everybody. Okay. So uh, over here, we have uh, Alia. Alia, I'm working as an education officer with an NGO, Turtle Conservation Society, TCS. Every year, we conduct educational programs with rural schools around Kamaman Trungano. We had always conducted outdoor learning sessions and the kids really enjoyed, but we can't do it anymore. So the main challenges I face to continue reaching out to these students is the technology ability in schools because here are rural schools. So we talk about rural schools that what happens if uh, there is zero devices at all, right? So uh, if the place we do not have internet access, let alone um, phones right, and devices, uh, could you comment on that, on how teachers should approach this process? Okay, so if you don't have devices and you don't have internet, but you would want to push for technology, I think as a nation, we are rich. We have the resources. It's, it's just not being mobilized properly. So one of the ways we can do is really mobilize devices and, and access to internet to, to rural areas. That's one, if you really think that technology is the right way to do it. Number two is to go back to physical packages. If technology is really out of the question, I would really recommend to then reorganize your, your program to be more of um, visuals that you send over to the students in terms of 
postcards ke you know um or or even if you send over a chromebook with nothing in it or or a laptop a simple one but with a pen drive that is filled with content then they don't have to have internet they can just use your pen drive so there are many different ways i would love to discuss this even this even more because i don't have the answer i would like to like have this discussion so that new ideas can can come in right so with regards to rural schools right we we actually have a, a sharer that will be on on day three right so he will be sharing with us uh, on 21st century learning on how you build 21st century learning in rural schools without internet access and without any devices okay so uh, a couple of questions also from me uh, alina uh, what i've seen that uh, what you have presented over here right is there a potential to convert all of our textbook learning or our KBSR from our primary school to secondary school syllabus onto uh, the format, like what you just shown, like the Pandir format, right? It works well with teaching Sajara, am I, am I correct? So is there any plans or are you training any Sajara teacher to develop more contents or materials like this? So we are we are actually going into a, a coaching mentoring session by the end of June with the Community Guru Digital Learning Plus. That is one of the initiatives that we are running with JPN Kedah Perlis and Sarawak, with 60 teachers for the new, for the new cohort. And the end goal for that cohort is to come up with enough resources that would fill up uh, the KSSM for their subject that they're teaching in remote learning format. So how would you do that? So so one of the there are already many resources here, Jay. Like everywhere, there are videos everywhere. There are Ben Soalan everywhere. But we need to help the teachers curate it in a way that is um, that is intuitive as well. So how do we you know curate the videos? Where do we get them? How do we how do we uh, plan the flow of that lesson? So that's something we're doing with uh, sixty teachers. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Question from Aziz Rajab. Do your team engage in PLC, lesson study, action research with teachers involving technology? So we do engage in PLC and lesson study, depending on the projects that we run with our partners. But we also are very, very open to um, schools approaching us, asking us to run these PLCs with them, especially in Penang, because we are uh, very active there. Schools have requested for us to train their teachers um, a lot of time. And if we are working with JPN and all that, you don't even have to worry about funding because then we will then um, find that funds for, for schools because I know funding is very limited for, for schools and teachers. Right. Okay, hope that answers your question, Aziz. Uh, so two more minutes before we have to uh, take a short break. So um, Alina, also uh, in terms of the development of syllabus, right? So I guess uh, what's, the, what's the outcome that you're trying to bring forth uh, or the platform that you are building over here, right? So for the future plans ahead, what can we expect from uh, your organization and your team with regards to education in the nation? So our team loves creating content that is very interactive and meaningful and relevant. So look out for more content that gets students to really experience learning uh, in terms of applying this, uh, these skills. Coming up as well, we have um, a few virtual camps that we are going to organize for students as part as yet for their co-curricular. So all of this is going to happen virtually. So, so look out for those. Right. Awesome. So uh, also to share with you, Alina, in terms of content wise, uh, yesterday I just spoke with someone uh, on the phone that he's currently uh, looking for all of the YouTube videos out there with regards to the lesson plans, right? From standard one all the way to form five, form six and uh, university as well. So he's currently trying to compile all of the videos out there onto one platform so that all teachers can get access towards it as well. So, so that's I guess, an what, amazing initiative. That's an amazing. Right. And, and the guy is like, uh, he's like trying to just give back to society and just working anon anonymously from there, right? So, uh, very awesome effort, and I'm very glad that you came and shared what you you just shared with us uh, today. So, uh, for everyone that is watching right now, uh, if you have any questions, please do uh, send in on the feedback form. Unfortunately, we would have to. Uh, Send off Alina. Uh, so Alina, so um, final thoughts or final uh, messages that you have for teachers or those who are watching right now? So to all my Cikgu Cikgu teachers, 
stay strong, stay resilient, stay together. We are in this long marathon together. So if at any point you need help and support, do reach out. Uh, we would love to help you, would love to support you because we know at the end of the day, it is our children that we are trying to, trying to help grow. All right. So with that, uh, with reluctant, uh, <laughs> we would have to say goodbye to Alina. So everyone, uh, if you would like to say goodbye, yeah. All right. So we hope to see you in future. And uh, for those of you who would like to see more of uh, Alina, uh, do let us know. So we hope to be able to invite Alina onto the uh, EduChat session so that uh, they can know more about your initiatives and activities out there. Thank you, Jay. Thanks for having me, everybody. All right. Take care. You too. Okay, so there you have it, Alina from Arus Academy. Yeah, if you are as uh, excited and uh, interested as I am on what they are doing, uh, please log in into uh, Alina's Arus Academy. So we will be sharing you all the links that she has just uh, shared with you just now. Also, I, I see that there are a lot of people which are actually sharing in the uh, chat uh, on the comment section as well. So keep it coming. So uh, I'm sure that a lot of you are having a lot of questions on how to create the tools that Alina has just mentioned. So please go in into Arus Academy's YouTube to find out more about it, right? So if you have enjoyed the session by Alina, please comment, enjoy, enjoy down there so that I know that uh, this is someone that we should be bringing in more in future, right? Because uh, Education Summit 2020, aside from Alina, there are a few more other uh, speakers which has established platforms like this, right? So they create tutorial videos and they have created a lot of uh, learning platforms for teachers and tutors and educators out there who are requiring a lot of this assistance, right? So uh, speakers that are coming on tomorrow, uh, Prof. Dr. Abdul Karim, one of them, they will have uh, an entire YouTube video series, right? that there's no way that you are you you will be left out on technology right so it's end of the day it's all up to your creativity and whether if you have the time right and the effort that you want to put in to create contents like this so alina has just demonstrated that using simple technology you can actually create a lot of fun and meaningful learning lessons for our children right and the best part is this after you have created it it will be there permanently as long as Google doesn't go bankrupt, the entire thing will always be there. So you're just doing it for once and you can use it for the many years to come. And that's the great thing about technology, right? So uh, I have to uh, end this session for today. So uh, for the next session, so we would cut short and immediately go to the next session. So which uh, I would end this broadcast over here. So for our next speaker will be CJ Lim. So I will see you on the next session.